Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Dr. Sherry Cran, the Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, and I am the co-chair of John Carroll University's COVID-19 Task Force. I do want to acknowledge that there was a school shooting that took place today in Knoxville. And at the beginning of this webinar, I think it would be important for us all just to take a moment of silence to recognize those who were injured today. Thank you for your attention to this very important issue. So COVID-19 has been a constant in our daily lives for more than a year. Here at John Carroll, we have navigated the pandemic with the health and well-being of our students as our top priority. Now, as we near the end of spring semester and hopefully inch closer to the end of the pandemic, we take time to reflect on the incredible resilience our community has shown. But it's not just those on our campus who have overcome this obstacle. Tonight, you'll hear from several distinguished alums of John Carroll who have been involved in the local, regional, and national response to the pandemic. Dr. Anderson, Dr. Beck, and Dr. Moore have been on the front lines of caring for individuals, protecting our communities, and shaping our country's response. The lessons on leadership and service will showcase the value of a Jesuit liberal arts education from John Carroll. Each of them come from different backgrounds with different fields of study and different life experiences. The invisible thread that unites them is the academic rigor, experiential learning and service, and personal formation they received at John Carroll. They are four of the more than 44,000 alumni who left John Carroll prepared for the future of work. I would like to take this opportunity to thank each of them for the difference they have made in the last year and for spending some time with our community tonight. With that, I'm pleased to welcome another John Carroll alum who's also making a difference. Tonight's moderator, a graduate of the class of 2009 and John Carroll's most recent Young Alumni Award winner from CBS News, Caitlin Huey Burns. Thank you so much, Sherry, for that introduction. And I welcome all of you. Thank you so much for joining us on a Monday night. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, we have a lot to get into today, and I'm really excited to hear from our panelists. Uh, so first, I want to go ahead and, and introduce everybody. Um, we'll start with Dr. Anderson. Uh, he is going to help us guide, guide us through the, the public policy component and kind of the current affairs in Washington. He's a pediatric critical care physician who's currently serving as a senior advisor to the Department of Health and Human Services. In this role, he's advising the Biden administration on the COVID response, including how to address immediate concerns, but also how to mitigate some of the longer term consequences of the pandemic on our younger generation. He previously chaired com committees and commissions under the Bush and Obama administrations and served uh, as vice president of university hospitals in Cleveland. He earned a medical degree from Case Western and an undergraduate degree in chemistry from John Carroll. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. And next we will welcome Dr. Eric Beck, who will be speaking to the healthcare system response and ways it has changed and how hospitals are operating and coordinating care in Northeast Ohio. He is the chief operating officer for University Hospitals Health System. Previously, he was the president of UH Ventures, where he was responsible for developing and deploying healthcare innovations. Dr. Beck earned his medical degree from Ohio University and his bachelor's degree in biology from John Carroll. And while at John Carroll, he helped establish a student-run volunteer EMS, which he continues to support today as its chief medical officer. 
And last but certainly not least, we are excited to welcome Dr. Martina Moore, who will speak to the mental health implications for families and schools and communities. Dr. Moore is a behavioral health care executive with more than 20 years of clinic clinical operations experience. She's the president and CEO of Moore Consulting. Counseling and Mediation Services, one of the largest mental health treatment agencies in Northeast Ohio. She's a licensed professional counselor and is the coordinator of John Carroll's Substance Use Disorder Counseling Program. She has a PhD in counselor education and supervision and earned her mas master's in counseling and human services from John Carroll. So I welcome all of you and I'm so excited that we were all together today, even virtually. I know we're all used to this by now, um, but here we are on Zoom. Uh, I don't know a better way to show kind of that we're still <laughs> in a pandemic. Um, so, so with that in mind, I, I wanna kind of talk about where we are today. Um, as of today, according to the CDC, 190 million doses of the vaccine have already been administered. So we're seeing shops and restaurants opening back up. Um, offices are starting to plan return to work policies. Um, for you Cleveland Indian fans, baseball season uh, has begun. The flowers are, are blooming. Weather is turning. Things seem to be getting better and a little brighter. But I want to take an honest assessment about where we actually are today. And I want to kick this off uh, to the panel. And, and Dr. Anderson, we'll start with you. We'll go in alphabetical order here. Um, um, from, from your area of expertise, what are some things to celebrate? What are causes for concern still? And how vigilant should we still be? First, my, my thanks to John Carroll for uh, inviting me, number one, and number two, talking about this really important topic. And, and I would agree, Caitlin, I think there's much to be celebrated if you think about what we were, where we were six months ago with ICUs at capacity, with the, the real worry of running out of staff stuff in space, um, a vaccine on the horizon, but certainly not here. Fast forward six months, we now have three EUA approved vaccines, um, vaccine rollout, and I still have lots of friends and family in Northeast Ohio. Vaccine rollout is, is hitting a really good pitch. And I know that Dr. Beck can talk more about how the systems are collaborating. Um, I've had friends who've been down to the Wolstein Center that said it was the most polite, um, amazing process to get people vaccinated. So for me as a physician and a former chemist, the fact that we went from thinking about a vaccine to two mRNA-based vaccines and one J&J &J in this short amount of time, and now that we've gotten over some speed bumps, that's much to be celebrated. And as you say, we're starting to see the thawing of the country. So I think that's to be celebrated. However, this isn't over yet. And the variants that have emerged, there's three specific ones. Um, I won't go into the names, but these variants appear to be more contagious Maybe some early data, they may be more deadly, although that has not really played out in the literature. That simply means we can't let our guard down too quickly. That uh, I know people are sick of masks, they're sick of not being able to congregate. Um, but I, I'm just concerned if you see what's happening in Michigan, um, the state I actually grew up. I was on the phone today as part of my work with HHS. Detroit is feeling like Cleveland felt several months ago with ICUs nearing capacity. I don't want that to happen to any other parts of the country. So I think that there's much to be celebrated in how rapidly science has addressed this. And I hope we can talk about that more um, tonight, but boy, we're, we're just not there yet. The, this P1 variant and the B117 variant, uh, and there's one more that I always forget the number on, um, the, these variants are of concern and I think cause us to say, not, not too quickly, we can't go too quickly. And, and Dr. Beck, same questions for you. What are causes for celebration, causes for concern? How vigilant should we still be from, from your perch as seeing the healthcare system handle this pandemic? Thanks, Caitlin. And um, uh, my thanks as well uh, for such a, an important discussion uh, tonight. Um, would maybe just build on what, uh, what Mike uh, mentioned. I, I think first and foremost, we should celebrate the fact that we've learned to treat a new disease. Um, and we've become quite good at it. Um, and, and certainly the learnings there of how to manage cycles of COVID, there have been several surges uh, throughout the country at different points in time, learning how to manage through those, those, uh, uh, those cycles of surge and learning how to care for both COVID and non-COVID populations in our community. 
out of that has grown an unprecedented amount of collaboration. And I would call that out as something worthy of celebration. All the health systems here in Northeast Ohio and across the state, quite frankly, um, have rallied together uh, in service to their community in a way that uh, the, the pandemic, uh, uh, perhaps nothing, nothing more than a pandemic can unite uh, folks who compete on some days and who really uh, bind together and, and unite to serve uh, the community on the other. From uh, a, a rising uh, COVID census uh, across the state, I, I do think we, we need to be concerned. Um, we shouldn't be alarmed, but we should be concerned. Uh, as uh, we just heard, the uh, risk is real that uh, COVID census can climb again, and we've, we've seen that even in uh, spite of the high vaccination rates we're seeing. Uh, and that, that leads me to where I would maintain vigilance, which is um, the variants and uh, vulnerable populations. We still know that uh, there are a number of vulnerable populations who have not yet been adequately vaccinated and continuing to target those folks who are disproportionately affected by this disease is gonna be an important part of how we manage the next chapter. Absolutely, that I think is such an important component and remains a challenge. And, and Dr. Moore, from your perspective as a mental health professional, um, what are you seeing and, and what are causes for uh, concern, celebration and ways to remain vigilant? Yeah, and, and thank you for inviting behavioral health to this table. Um, it's, it's really important in this whole picture. And I would start out by saying the greatest accomplishment was our ability to quickly shift into telehealth. Um, I, I remember sitting at my office in March and realizing clients could not come in my office anymore and what we needed to do in all five of our offices in order to still connect. And, and I mean, it just happened immediately and we really transitioned very well and found a way to still be able to connect with our clients, give them the services that they needed um, and find ways that they could still know that we're still here to, here to provide those services for them. I was also very appreciative of our governor who took the restrictions off of telehealth so that we could really open it up as we needed to. And then um, within our communities, um, just encouraging people to really utilize it. On that same note, there's still some work to be done. Um, there are still many individuals that do not have access um, to, to internet as well as to the ability to um, connect on telehealth, be it a smartphone, be it a computer or laptop. And so in some of our underserved populations, that is still a struggle to be able to connect with them and get the services that they need so that they can still have um, behavioral health services. Um, one of the other um, pieces that is still very relevant to us now, and the report just came out on last week from the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner that we have seen an increase in overdoses from opiates as well as cocaine and as well as amphetamines. And so while we were um, working on COVID and, and rightfully so, um, the, the other things were still rising. And um, we were not giving it as much attention because we were focusing on saving lives from COVID and not realizing that the other um, diseases were fueling. And so as a result, um, we do still have um, some, some serious problems with overdose, especially here in Northeast Ohio, and they've increased significantly. Um, and as well as um, suicide completion rates in our youth, as well as attempts at suicide um, have increased. And so those are things that we're not proud of, that we know that we still need to work on. And there's um, a lot of literature out there now saying, you know, it is directly related to, you know, people not being in school, children not having access, children not being able to get out of the home environment that may not have been appropriate for them in the first place. And then the stress of having daycares closed, families at home, um, domestic violence, increased um, just drug and alcohol use. So the whole, um, all those factors have just played into this um, that has really caused a great deal of stress and um, ongoing problems within our behavioral health care field. Absolutely. It seems like the consensus from everybody is that we have come a long way. There's still a lot more work to do, but there's going to be these lingering residual effects, not necessarily tied to the actual uh, pandemic, but kind of the collateral damage from it all. And I think it's important to, to keep an eye uh, on that as well. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, I should note that we are getting in some questions from our audience, and we also got some questions from audience members before, um, uh, during 
sign up. So I'm going to do my best to try to uh, incorporate all of these questions into the conversation uh, as best as we can. And I, I do wanna pick up with you, Dr. Moore, on something that someone um, had asked, and this relates to um, what has kind of become this term of, of the COVID blues. Uh, you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, are there uh, signs of a more serious health problem, uh, mental health problem like depression? And this person wonders, you know, what's the range of quote, normal responses to what we've been experiencing over this past year? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I would say normal has to be measured by each person. So there are some people that were already struggling with depression and we've seen that exacerbated. And then we've seen others that it has been exacerbated and it's come on um, as a result of it. Some of the things we look at um, um, are their sleeping patterns, their eating patterns, and even their socialization. Now we know that that was really limited through COVID, but many of us were able to find other ways to connect. If you find a person that's not even able to connect in the other ways, like through Zoom or um, through phone calls or, or, or just reaching out in, in different ways, then you really wanna look at them. If their coping skills um, have changed, where their coping skills um, are, in, are an increase in eating, or a decrease in eating or an increase in sleeping or a decrease in sleeping. If the patterns have, have, have gone off in either direction, we really need to look at that. I say, if it's gone on for a couple of weeks, they really need to check in with someone. Someone was just asking me, well, what about children? Because it's very difficult to get children in with a psychiatrist. I said, the best person to start with is their pediatrician. The pediatricians are the best place to start to get them directed to someone. They are the experts with children. And, and even if they can't help them in that area, they have other resources to be able to help them. And so getting the children in front of their pediatricians, even if it's on um, a virtual session so that they can look at them and say, okay, maybe this is what we need to do. And the same way with the adults, um, just you know, encouraging people to reach out and, and really get sessions. The great thing about telehealth is we're able to expand our hours, we're able to expand our days. Um, we can get more done actually in a shorter period of time. I really believe we're more we're working more now than what we did before COVID. Um, and so that is, there's just so many opportunities to help people connect. So if you have family and friends that are just just not sure about if you're not seeing them coping very well have them reach out or reach out for them and, and help them to do it. Um, so that would be my answer to that. Dr. Anderson, I feel like this is a good segue to you since you have obviously experience in pediatric care. Um, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on what Dr. Moore just said? And we also have a question from the audience that I think you can answer too, which is, um, why should I get the vaccine if I still have to wear a mask and social distance everywhere I go? Great question. Uh, Dr. Moore teed it up so well, and, and note that we didn't rehearse this beforehand, but I think uh, the synchrony between your three guests is going to be really good. Um, I, as a pediatrician, as a father, as a grandfather, um, I just want to talk a little bit about kids and maybe we can come back to it. I think there's been a misnomer um, in, in multiple circles. So, well, kids aren't really affected by this because thank God they're not flooding the intensive care unit. They haven't been you know, severely hit with disease, although there are 350 children across this country that have died uh, from complications of COVID, kids under 14. So there are 300 families that are mourning the loss of their kids. But kids have been affected to the core. And I think Dr. Moore set it up so nicely. We have got children that have been isolated, that are being taught in two dimensions, where a trained set of eyes aren't on them morning, noon, and night, where social workers and teachers and professionals that do this for a living are, are trying to, and I'm sure they're doing the best they can in this two-dimensional world, but there isn't the community around that child as much. Another statistic that I've seen that just scares the heck out of me is the number of child abuse cases reports has gone way down. That's not a good thing. That means that we're not detecting kids that are being neglected or abused because they're isolated. The second thing I will say, and I'm so glad Dr. Moore is on this panel, um, is the mental health crisis for kids was bad going in, that the amount of resources that we can bring to take care of kids pre-pandemic is anemic at best and, and embarrassing at worst. Now the number of children that have issues, I, I keep in touch with my residency friends um, who are just, just torn up, They're general, most of them are general pediatricians, the 
numbers of kids with OCD, the numbers of kids with newly diagnosed anxiety disorder. So um, I, I think the future is going to mean it's great we're going to get back to school. Um, but I always say I think there's a really large hunk of scarred children that are coming back that are going to need a whole of society. It's not just the teachers. I agree, and I'll talk about pediatricians in a second, um, but, but we've got to pay attention to these kids because there's an entire generation of children that are at risk. The vaccine debate. Um, we will get away from masks. We will get away from not being able to go to mass or restaurants in groups or weddings in large groups when we achieve that big term called herd immunity. And I've seen on social media, people don't like to be compared to cattle. We're not trying to compare people to cattle. We're trying to say the lar when a large percentage of people are vaccinated and thus cannot transmit the virus back and forth, that's when we get back to normal. So personally and professionally, my recommendation, and I'd love to hear what Eric thinks, is if you vaccinate yourself, if you get the vaccine, A, it's been proven to be safe in, in multiple trials. I literally ran to my first appointment. Two, you now have almost zero risk of getting critically ill from COVID. And you're also protecting your family and your community because you're not going to spread it. So getting the vaccine at large percentage of patients or population, I should say, then gets us to more normalcy. So it's it's, I understand the vaccine hesitancy and maybe we can talk about, we're probably gonna need like a three hour webinar, by the way, I don't know if we have that kind of time. Um, but I think getting vaccinated is gonna get us back to normal. Thank you for that, Dr. Anderson. And Dr. Beck, I want you to, to weigh in here as well. Um, um, distribution is the, the word of the day these days in terms of the vaccine um, and getting people to have a level of comfort with it, to be able to get access to it, and especially those vulnerable populations to get access to it. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more directly uh, to, to what An Dr. Anderson was, was talking about. And also, um, since you are um, uh, you know, seeing this firsthand from, from where you, you sit, uh, what are the, the kind of longer term changes, do you think, to the healthcare system because of this pandemic? Well, I, I'll echo Mike's sentiments. I mean, I think vaccines are uh, incredibly important and, you know, barring any true contraindication, meaning, you know, known allergic reaction, et cetera, which only you and your provider can sort of assess. I think um, it's, a, it's an important responsibility for all of us to be thinking about how we can contribute to keeping ourselves safe and helping uh, get to a herd immunity uh, situation in our communities uh, sooner. As Dr. Moore mentioned though, I think um, there's sort of this interesting paradox of, of the pandemic accelerating innovation uh, out of necessity. Uh, virtual care, as you heard, uh, has been very real for our organization. And uh, I think that that is something that's here to stay. I don't know that we've figured out exactly how to uh, optimize uh, its utilization. And obviously you, you don't wanna have a relationship with healthcare practitioners that's exclusively virtual. Uh, and, and some conditions quite frankly can't be treated effectively that way. But I think uh, as we continue to, to, to leverage that innovation really conceived from the pandemic, uh, that's gonna be a, a huge component here to stay. I think, you know, tying the two together, uh, our organization here in Northeast Ohio has, has uh, provided over 100,000 vaccines. We're working lock and lock with the other health systems, jointly supporting the state effort uh, at the Wolstein Center here. Uh, today, vaccine is not the scarce resource it was even six weeks ago or, you know, uh, three months ago. And so as that resource becomes more plentiful, uh, I think we're going to see strategies really trying to support those vulnerable segments that haven't had access historically uh, and really trying to close the gap uh, on, uh, on, on getting to, to herd immunity. I would, I would say lastly, um, the pandemic has exposed real vulnerabilities in our health system and, and health system in the inclusive sense of the word, public health, public safety, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, physicians and other providers, as well as the behavioral health community. I think uh, whether it be things like supply chain that we, we saw uh, brought into the spotlight early in the pandemic, or now uh, sort of the, uh, the shadow crisis, which is uh, concern around uh, mental health, uh, wellness, resiliency of healthcare practitioners who've been going really nonstop for a year and a half, uh, that, that toll is, is still being measured. And 
uh, as we heard from Dr. Moore before, whether it's, it's children, whether it's uh, those that have been isolated, uh, or whether it's even healthcare practitioners who've been serving dutifully uh, and fatigue is setting in, uh, we're going to need to be mindful to all of those as part of the reality going forward for, uh, for health systems. Thank you, Dr. Beck. And, and I, I want to pick up on a few of those points as we transition into our next segment, which is what is ahead. Um, and, and one of the points that, that you were making um, is about what might stay with us. Um, so I wanted to open this back up to the panel. Um, you know, as we mentioned, we're, we're more than a year into this. Um, this. This pandemic has reshaped how we live, how we learn, how we work, our behaviors, our practices. Um, from, from your vantage point, what practices and behaviors and, and learnings do you think should stay with us? Um, and what do you think will stay with us? I'll try from the federal angle that, that I'm honored to be in right now. And I think that this has been a learning experience for all of us. And I think there's areas that we're very proud of. Um, and I think, by the way, I'm a contractor. I don't speak on behalf of the federal government. I'm just a, a consultant for them. Um, but I, I think that um, the future is going to mean, to, to Dr. Beck's good point, um, rebuilding of public health. And that's not just bricks and mortar, but that's thinking about how do we rapidly identify an organism? How do we assure that supply chain is intact? How do we, um, you know, this whole concept of emergency use authorization we've talked about, how do we rapidly educate our caregivers as to what these vaccines and therapies are, um, what the appropriate uses are, and then help them collect the data to get even better at it. I'll give you one small example. Um, once again, kids have not been as affected medically by this pandemic, but there's a very rare uh, and concerning disease called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC. Um, I was so impressed of how academia, the World Health Organization, researchers in Italy, researchers here in the States came together, identified this new disease in kids, figured out the best therapy, got the word out, and within about five weeks, it didn't have it settled down, but it had it encapsulated as a new disease with these therapies. So my hope for the future is, um, and my hope is not that we have another pandemic, but I think the numbers would, would, would prove we probably will have something again in the future, I think these bridges that we've built between academia, the international community, and the great medical centers uh, like UH, the, where Eric works, uh, I think is going to be um, actually really uh, something good for our kids and our grandkids. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that that power of collaboration, bringing people closer together is a theme that resonates. I think um, uh, like many industries, there are uh, silos that exist within any industry, uh, and those um, uh, are the accumulation of years of, uh, of, of unique strategies. And the pandemic, I think, has created a, a unification around a shared mission, a shared purpose, an appreciation for how connected uh, each of the disciplines playing a, a major role in the pandemic are, whether that be basic science, as, as was described regarding vaccine and understanding therapies and even understanding the disease, to uh, public health practitioners and understanding the tools of prevention and engaging with high risk and, and vulnerable populations, to um, behavioral health and mental health and the derivatives of that, as we heard earlier about substance abuse and other, other diseases that plague us that are sort of being rebalanced. So as we think about how, uh, how we come together going forward, I think there's a, a mutual appreciation uh, for all of the disciplines uh, in the health system that um, you know, really is a silver lining. Yeah, and I would just echo that um, from the behavioral health care model. Um, right before the pandemic, we had really been pushing over the last year what's called integrated behavioral health care. And we have just seen it go to a new level um, where we have integrated um, so well with, um, with all the different disciplines, be it um, psychiatry, psych psychologists, the medical professionals, um, social workers, um, and even um, those, um, the law enforcement. I mean, we really had to partner throughout this pandemic with law enforcement and we're spending more time at the table looking at how as a team we can really um, tackle all of this. And so it's, it's forced us to be, to, um, to be more collaborative and to work together. And, and from, a, from a human behavior standpoint, I think everybody 
as we're talking about COVID is kind of wondering, okay, when are we going to get back to, to normal and, and what is that actually going to look like? I mean, here we are sitting on Zoom having this incredibly interesting conversation and I can't help but think I wish we were all in person together having this conversation. We've, we've adapted so beautifully, I think, uh, to having these conversations virtually. Um, but but as we're, we're kind of talking about what, what the future looks like kind of in the immediate and, and longer term, I, I'm wondering from, from your perspective, perspectives, your various perspectives, um, what do you think uh, from, a, from a human behavior perspective as it, as it relates to kind of how we live and work, for you Dr. Moore or um, for Drs. Anderson and Beck, um, how, how we think about our own health? Um, are we going to be more vigilant about our own health? Are we going to see a doctor more regularly? Um, are our healthcare systems more prepared? We can kind of get into that a little bit. Yeah, I'll start with that from the behavioral health end. I am finding that more people are cautiously optimistic about going back in. Um, I, I have clients that are telling me that are, they're very afraid that their companies are preparing for them to come back this summer or this fall. And they really are not a proponent of completely going back in. Um, people say this going back to normal. I really do think we're going to have a new normal and we're gonna define what that new normal is going to look like. Um, and, and, and the anxiety that I'm hearing from people around, you know, we're going back, we're going to start doing things again um, in the way that we used to, I just don't believe as humans, um, the majority of us will feel comfortable with that and we'll push back on some of that. Um, so I think that we're gonna be forced to kind of reshape the way this looks um, and, and meet people at a place that are comfortable for them and still getting the work done that we need to get done. I mean, we've already proven we can get the work done. Um, in, in many industries, not all, but many industries. Um, and so I think that, that people's trepidation from to going full force back in is just going to change that. Um, and I'll just say this one last thing. We did a little survey within our department and um, we wanted to survey in our graduate department um, with the clinical mental health counseling students, how many of them wanted to either be hybrid or, or go stay completely online or um, go back into the classroom. And 30% of them wanted to stay completely online. And about, um, well, I think it was about 50, no, yes, about 50% wanted a hybrid. And it was only like 20% that wanted to go back completely into the classroom. And wow. so that really told us a lot about where our student body is as well with feeling comfortable with this. So uh, the, the Jesuits taught me to, to debate or to, to have a, a clashing of ideas. And I'm just gonna be controversial for a second. Uh, as to the human behavior and when we have masks and how we can gather in more than groups of three, I think we'll get there. I think we'll get back to something that looks. Um, but but I, I, I hope we don't get back to completely normal because I think Dr. Beck said it really well. This pandemic had silver linings, had things we're proud of, but it exposed so many things that we must do better. And we got caught um, I don't want to say unprepared, but but we had things we didn't do well. And, and Eric talked about supply chain and thinking about surge and thinking about rapid dissemination of information. And, and are we equitable in what we do? And another thing that the Jesuits bring to your heart is social justice. And, and I, I hope we don't get back to things as normal because there are too many things in our system that need fixing. And, and I think that we will get back to a semblance of what we felt like in whatever it was, 2019 or whatever the normal was. But, but um, I think the young generation that's listening to this, that's thinking about a Carroll education, that is thinking about potentially a healthcare education, I hope we don't get back tomorrow. We got too much to fix and too much to get better at. Well, well said. Um, I think that's a provocative, uh, a provocative statement uh, and, and don't, don't disagree with um, with that. I, I'll, I'll take maybe a different angle um, just to complement the other two perspectives. Um, there's a notion emerging from, from the NIH and others uh, within healthcare around whole health and really thinking holistically about humans and the intersection with uh, social uh, influencers, uh, the spiritual dimension, uh, faith, uh, culture, uh, community dynamics, uh, as well as things like structural and, and built environment or nutrition, et cetera. And I think the pandemic 
um, at least for me and for, for many that I talk to, has really highlighted the interconnectivity of all of those uh, dimensions in terms of how you feel psychologically, how you feel physically. Um, and in many cases, it contributes directly to how people fare during the pandemic with COVID, uh, with the other challenges that the pandemic has placed on people. And so I think that there's an opportunity to, to think more holistically about what does health mean, the relationship of family, friends, community, uh, and uh, those things that maybe aren't classically um, the true science of, of healthcare, but really all those other pieces that science has established are meaningfully um, uh, impactful in, in outcomes or um, in being able to uh, to withstand the test that this uh, pandemic has brought. The Jesuits also teach you to admit when you're wrong. I want a nice new normal that, uh, that takes all the things into account. So Dr. Beck helped bring me off that <laughs> plan. Whoever, whoever picked all of you, it's just perfect compliments to, 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 every, to everyone. This, this is just such a great conversation. And of course, you know, I'd be, be remiss if, if I didn't note that given all the lives lost, um, of course, for so many families in this country and around the world, back to normal is just not a thing that um, they'll be able to, to experience. Um, but I, I appreciate these perspectives. I, I do want to, to kind of shift more into the future here, since we have some prospective students uh, or their families joining us um, and, and, and talk about kind of the reason that we're all here this evening. Um, we uh, are, are really honored to be in the company of, of any prospective students who are, are joining us. Um, this, this generation is uniquely shaped by this pandemic, I think. And I think in turn, they have all of these new opportunities to lead in these various fields. Um, so I want to turn it back over to our panelists and, and, and kind of talk about, you know, how, how did your John Carroll education prepare you for your respective fields? And what are some of these new and exciting opportunities opening up in your fields that you may not have anticipated before, but are coming into view because of the pandemic? So I guess I'll start. Um, so John, my John Carroll experience, I, I mean, it really prepared me to be a leader. Um, I, I remember sitting in my courses um, for the clinical mental health counseling program and realizing that I, I, that I was going to practice as a counselor and that I was going to be a business owner. And I, and I was really supported in that from John Carroll. Um, and also that I would be an advocate, that I would be involved in policy, I would be involved in legislation, um, that um, I would have a well-rounded experience and then someday have the opportunity um, to go further and come back and teach the next generation. And so for many years, I was excited about the opportunity to come back and then I was afforded that opportunity to come back and to lead and to, um, and to be able to um, teach the current generation. And so, um, I'm just I'm just so proud of what I received there, especially as a minority. Um, just the, the the experience that I had and the support. I always talk about um, my, my my department chair, who is now uh, retired, Dr. Chris Favor. I remember him just encouraging me, and he just continued to say to me, "Martina, you're more than a counselor. You're also a leader. You will also be a business owner, and you will also do great things." And I took those words with me so far, and it just encouraged me, even in days where I didn't feel like I was. So I um, just felt so supported. I'll, uh, I'll give a, a, a slightly different answer. I, I would say I, I can't deny that, that from a leadership standpoint, it, it certainly was um, uh, foundational in my development. But perhaps where I, I've come to appreciate now, John Carroll figured even largely in my development was um, through discernment of personal values, of integrity. Uh, many of the classes I took actually outside of my science major have influenced me greatly uh, as I think about being a good citizen, um, about serving uh, a higher purpose, about being able to connect and to mobilize around uh, important work, whether that be uh, at home, uh, at, at, uh, uh, at my, uh, my organization or, or in my community. And, a liberal arts education creates um, a crucible for uh, both experiential and um, classroom uh, uh, 
activities to inform that discernment journey for a young person. And uh, I'm personally grateful for that. And I think that uh, John Carroll, uh, you know, was, was certainly contributory in, in the, uh, the degree preparation required for a career as a health professional. Uh, but I think even, even more largely, the relationships and the community connectivity um, really stands out for me. And I just add on to those two wonderful um, comments or those two wonderful uh, panelist comments. Um, and I've tried to just reflect back on what, what did John Carroll bring to my helping lead? I was leading a hospital system for part of this pandemic and now with the federal government for part of it. Um, and I, I think a couple things stand out. First is, is learning rapidly. And I think the crucible is, is a great uh, analogy because that liberal arts education you want to be really good in English and you want to make sure that you take things that you're interested in, like political science, or I took the most amazing communication course from Dr. Jackie Schmidt that really um, was foundational for me. Um, so the, the, the Jesuit liberal arts approach, I think, um, just paid dividends for me because with all this incoming information, you could prioritize, you could get to the science, you could discern what was real and what was fluff. So that was really important. I think there's something that also comes a little bit with, with age, uh, and, and that is being a man or woman for others. I mean, we talk about it all the time, it's sort of baked into your Carroll education, but when you get out into the real world and have to make choices and you have to stay true to your ethics and you have to make sure that you are taking care of the most vulnerable, that's not just a punchline or a saying, it really becomes your Northern uh, guiding light. And, and I, I'm forever grateful to the Jesuits uh, in general and to John Carroll in particular, because um, with each year, although I've been out since 86, with each year, I'm just more and more appreciative. And I think just to your second point, Caitlin, um, I think medicine is going to be the most fascinating career over the next 30 years, not just because we have to rebuild public health, but even pre-COVID, the innovations that are coming down the pipe, this notion of precision medicine, where we alter a patient's medications based on their genetic code. I mean, that's real, and that's going to be the reality of medicine in the future. So I can think of no better career, uh, and I can think of no better place to prepare you than Carol. I think you all are uh, the epitome of, of service, and that's such a, an important point, um, men and women for others and, and our service to others. And the healthcare profession is quite literally a service, um, but going above and beyond this past year, as you all have done. Um, a, a couple of questions related to this that we've gotten from the audience are, are what are some of the, um, of, of the attributes or, or qualities you think um, are necessary for someone in the healthcare profession um, or as it relates to, to public policy? I think resilience, <laughs> uh, you know, Eric mentioned that we're, we've been at this as a marathon. I don't know any marathon that goes for 17 or 15 months. Um, I think resilience is important in healthcare. I think flexibility, uh, and, and I would emphasize teamwork. Um, when I went to medical school, I was in medical school for, you know, the first two years are mostly in the classroom and the second two years are mostly in the wards. Um, and that's the first time we interacted with nursing students or respiratory therapy students or psychology interns. And the whole notion of teamwork has permeated medicine now because to, for that patient to get the best care, the nurse, the nurse practitioner, the doc, the pharmacist all have to work in concert. And I think that became even more important during the pandemic. So um, I, I think that teamwork is so vital an attribute that once again, I, I think uh, John Carroll does a great job at helping you prepare. I'll uh, double click on the teamwork concept and maybe expand out. I, I too uh, enjoyed the class with Dr. Schmidt, that uh, communications class uh, was a, a big influencer for me and sort of stands out. Uh, but communication uh, and the ability to think about um, how to critically appraise uh, uh, data and to reflect that back in a way that is either persuasive or uh, um, influential, I think is a, a really important skill set, regardless of whether you uh, pursue nursing or pharmacy or uh, uh, another type of practice. I think um, there are going to be, uh, by any estimation, um, a growing need for healthcare practitioners of all types. And as the pandemic has highlighted, there's a number of new and emerging roles around uh, 
public health, population health, healthcare data and analytics, uh, the business of healthcare, healthcare leadership that perhaps uh, are really coming into their own now in a way that only the pandemic has been able to, um, to elevate uh, the importance of those sort of non-clinical uh, types of uh, healthcare leaders. And um, uh, Carol, if, if nothing else, I think um, provides a wonderful foundation for leadership and healthcare is uh, a, a growing, uh, uh, a growing, uh, in growing need of leaders, uh, particularly with uh, the, the aging of our population and the future projected demand uh, on behavioral health, not only from the pandemic, but uh, with the demographics. And, and Dr. Moore, how about you in, in your field? Where are you seeing shifts or, or opportunities for students who might be interested in a, a career in mental health? Um, we are really um, at a, um, disadvantage right now, we really need more people in our field. I need to say that. Um, recently, there was a report that came out and, and they projected by the year, I think it was 2025, um, that we will be significantly understaffed in the behavioral health care field um, if we don't do something quickly. And so um, the programs that John Carroll um, is putting in place in order to recruit and to teach and to educate more people um, as it pertains to behavioral health care, I, I think is ahead of the game. We are currently developing um, cohorts and models um, that will assist people with getting done quicker um, while still reaching all of their goals, as well as we're creating specialty tracks um, that will be online um, and, and in some more cohort models. And so we're really looking um, at ways that we can get more people into the field at a faster rate, but still getting all of the core curriculum that they need. We're not going to cut any corners on any of the classes, any of the credit hours, or, or any of that, just the way that we actually provide the service. Um, we are already being um, an owner of a healthcare uh, or behavioral healthcare agency. I can already tell you that in Ohio, we're all picking out of the same pot when it comes to hiring individuals. And so we're already at a shortage. And so we're afraid of what's going to happen really soon um, because the numbers are increasing for individuals who need help. And we don't have enough of us in order to provide the services. And so um, our, our, our goal is to um, attract more young people to the field, make it more attractive for them um, and really set them up so that they can get in the field quicker um, and be able to be more involved um, in, in, in community agencies, private agencies or wherever they see themselves. Thank you for that. It, it seems like there are a lot of long-term opportunities, but a lot of immediate opportunities to consider, which I think um, is a hopeful uh, thing for a lot of our, our students and, and even alumni who are who are turning in, tuning in. Um, I, I want to um, kind of take this conversation further and, and incorporate some of the other questions that we've been getting in. Um, and, and since all of you serve in some type of leadership positions, uh, we had one question about um, what are the toughest decisions that you've had to make in your role during this pandemic and how did you make them? I'll start off and it's it's the term triage and any clinician knows triage means you've got a limited amount of resources and you've got to get the right patient to the right place. And what's different about this disaster as opposed to even something as bad as Hurricane Katrina or Superstorm Sandy um, is just the scale. And, and so the toughest decision in my agency, which is called ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, is the need is here and the resources are here. And how do you triage um, where where resources go? And it, it has been, um, and it continues to be an ongoing, really tough challenge because um, you know we we don't have enough nurses and we don't have enough physicians that can respond. Um, so I think that the triage ones have been the toughest. I would agree with Eric, however. Um, Carol really teaches you in short order to sift through data, to, to mine for what is the nugget of really important data, and, and then to prioritize. So just like when I was a practicing intensive care doc, triage is really tough because you've got to make critical decisions uh, very, very quickly. But um, the notion of, of limited resources and this kind of need, uh, I, I think has been a really tough decision. And I know just talking with clinicians across this country, there's some really heartbreaking um, discussions of, of decisions that, that physicians had to make. I'll uh, build on that. Um, 
you know, I, I think uh, triage rings rings uh, true for me as well, but I'll, I'll maybe take it in a couple of, of additional directions to add a little color. One is um, this pandemic, unlike many other types of situations in which there are scarce resources and that prioritization exercise is required, this was affecting the entire globe simultaneously. And so the ability to ask friends or peer institutions down the road across the state wasn't really a, an opportunity here because everyone was being affected simultaneously. So you were kind of um, going it alone. At the same time you were going it alone, um, there was a high degree of uncertainty because this was a new disease, the precedent setting in many ways. And so managing um, quickly uh, with limited data, a high degree of uncertainty at a time in which everyone else who you may call on for counsel is simultaneously going through the same thing, um, is really a, a challenging um, circumstance to find yourself in as a leader. I think we all have networks and peer groups that we leveraged, but they were equally uh, in, in a similar place and, and that's perhaps unique to this. Um, I think the way that that really manifests itself was an ethical imperative around how do we maintain access to services in a way that really does the greatest good for the greatest number. And um, connecting it back, I uh, was uh, really drawn to philosophy, almost a philosophy major at John Carroll. And, you know, questions about ethics and about really stress testing the logic behind our decisioning criteria, uh, as Mike mentioned, you know, these, these prioritization decisions are part and parcel for clinical training, um, but this scale was really unprecedented. And I think being able to rest on sound reasoning um, uh, guided by a, an ethical imperative, um, you know, a, 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 a community lens um, was, was really uh, an important takeaway for me. Um, and I'll just pick off where um, Dr. Beck said, and, and he said it so well. Um, one of the things that I've been saying throughout this is that every single person on the globe at this at, at, during this time was experiencing trauma. All of us were. And so the 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 biggest dilemma that I had, um the hardest thing that I had was to take care of my 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 clinical team who was experiencing trauma and helping them to still provide services to their clients. Um, at the same time and doing that balancing act. And so I remember looking at them and, and we had to come up with a decision of how many people we were gonna have come in the building, what level of sick they, they, they had to be in order to come in the building, um, where their depression was, if they were suicidal, if they were withdrawing. I mean, we had to make all those decisions and I still had to protect my team. And I still had to give them permission to say, you know what, but if you don't feel good today, if you don't feel safe, then I'll be here. And I remember one day it was me there and it was almost me by myself. And, but, but, but I had to make that decision because I had to protect them as well. And it was a tough decision, but it was not tough because as John Carroll and as um, Dr. Anderson said so well, we were taught to be men and women for others. So I had to make that decision. I had to do it for my team as well as for the clients that we serve. That's such a great point. And, and a reminder that those philosophy classes do uh, pay off and have a, uh, an effect on, um, on all of us. Um, we are, are coming down to our last few minutes here and I wish we could uh, continue this discussion uh, for another hour, um, but I'm so grateful for, for all of the questions we have coming in. I'd, I'd just like to incorporate um, one more that we had from someone who is joining us uh, live um, and, and feel free whoever would like to tackle this. Uh, maybe Dr. Beck, this is, is for you, but um, there is an interest in, in this idea that we have collected so much data throughout this process. Um, and so how, how are our healthcare communities um, um, tracking all of that data and outcomes um, of COVID and um, kind of deciphering how it how it gets uh, implemented. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we could kind of go around uh, quickly and, and address address that in some way. Yeah, I'm happy to take a start. I, I mean, I think um, all organizations uh, are on a journey. They all started at different places in terms of their sophistication with data. I think uh, that includes governmental bodies, public health officials, the federal government, uh, industry and science partners. And the pandemic has forced us all to move faster, to share more, 
and to realize that it's the power of those analytical insights that really fuel the learning cycle that you know we've come to really embrace and, and, and I think is responsible for most of the good that's really emerging from the pandemic. But it's still a journey. And um, for as many stories of success, there's lots of challenges and fumbles that can be uh, recounted. And so um, it's, a, it's a journey of persistence. It isn't for for the weary or faint of heart, it's a long game where you know course correction after an initial stumble is uh, to be expected. So um, I think it's a, a really insightful question from whoever asked for it, and I think there's work to be done there. Uh, but it's a decade of work. It's not something that's um, you know further than uh, you know kind of mile marker one. And just to tag on what Eric said, it's there's a unique tension. You want to learn quickly and bring innovation to the bedside to save as many patients as possible, but you also have to make sure that you're doing it with rigor and, and based on data and, and what defines a best practice. So I would agree, um, if you look at the mortality rate of patients in the intensive care unit with COVID, it has consistently come down. Why? because just like Eric said, we, we've gotten good at sharing and we understand that it doesn't take 10 years to get a New England Journal trial out. We can, we can rapidly learn, um, but there are fumbles too. We've got two monoclonal antibody therapies that UH, the clinic, um, have been terrific at helping us distribute, but we're still gathering data in real time despite being 14 months uh, into this. So um, I think for anybody interested in this as a career, like I said a couple of minutes ago, this is gonna be a fascinating time. It's also gonna be a time to help us think how to do this better. How do we not take 10 years, which is the typical time between a discovery and it becomes standard of care. How do we how do, we do this in a more rapid fashion? And that's one of the most exciting things about healthcare for the next 30 years, as far as I'm concerned. And, and I want to kind of end this on, on a, a positive note, kind of looking forward. Um, and I hate to put people on the spot or make them answer very quickly, but um, one question we had in a variety of different ways are, are what are our lessons of healthy living that we can take with us? Dr. Mora, start with you. I can say for myself, the greatest lesson of healthy living um, is really connecting with the people that 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 I care about and with my family and finding ways to connect even when we're, when we're across the country or across the globe. Um, this pandemic forced us to do that. Um, I was, you know, connecting with family and friends all over the world um, in ways um, that I had never thought about connecting and and more intentional about it. And so, if nothing else, I, I say that we should continue to do that because we now know that we have avenues and ways to do that. My parting shot is exactly what Dr. Moore said about 50 minutes ago, and it's at my pediatrician hat. Um, I think one of the things we have to learn is the medical home, whether it's your internal medicine doc, your nurse practitioner, your family medicine doc, or your pediatrician, that medical home is really important. And we've got to make sure that that connection grows stronger and stronger because the medical home is going to help patients sift through all of these questions and all this information. So um, the strength of the medical home is, is really important to me uh, for the next forever period. Yeah, I, I, uh, I echo Dr. Moore's sentiments. I really think that um, this pandemic reminded us how fragile life really is and how connected we really are and interconnected we really are. And there's an opportunity for us to be um, more um, intentional uh, and, and mindful in our actions. And, you know, whatever your particular role is personally, professionally, you know, leading an organization, leading a team, it all starts with leading yourself and taking care of yourself. And a big part of that is being connected to others. So um, just a posture of gratitude, I think, is really a takeaway for me. And the power of connectivity is so important and something that I think we've all taken away from John Carroll and the ability for all of us who have never actually met in real life, but have this connection uh, to this great institution, even after all of these years, um, and to continue these conversations, I hope, um, in the coming days and weeks and months 
ahead. I am so grateful to all of you for joining us here and for your insights, your expertise. Um, I think it's just so exciting uh, to, to hear your experiences, but also what's on the horizon. Um, and if we can take any kinds of, of lessons and, and um, ways to move forward from this pandemic, I think you all have outlined them uh, so beautifully. So I'm so grateful for your time and for everybody for joining us uh, on this Monday evening. Um, I know there is so much more we could have discussed, um, but I hope that we were able to answer everybody's questions and, and address kind of where we are and where we're headed. And let me just close us out this evening. Caitlin, thank you so much for serving as our moderator tonight. Um, you are just such a terrific example of uh, our John Carroll education as our Eric, Mike, and Martina. Uh, this panel presentation has really, really been helpful to our audience members. And you are all such examples of the power of a John Carroll education. I would like to remind all of our attendees and everyone who's registered that you will receive a link to this webinar by the end of the week. And finally, for our prospective students and families who are watching tonight, we look forward to seeing you on campus and welcoming you to the class of 2025. Good night.